My name is Pete Ryman. I'm an animal rights advocate. I am a community outreach organizer and I am also an animal caregiver and animal tech in Gainesville, Florida. Oh my goodness. Sandpaper. Ooh, you got some. Oh. Nope, she's running. She's like, she's like, Too no, many no. humans. I went vegan in June of 2019, June 24th to be exact. And the way that I went vegan was <clears throat> I was having a emotionally difficult day. Uh, I had a retail shop in North Georgia and it wasn't the best month for us, especially wasn't the, be the best day that particular day. And I was a bit in my own head and my own feelings and I retired to the back of the lounge um, where I would normally stand behind the counter and greet people when they came in. Well, nobody was, nobody was coming in, so I retired to the lounge and I thought, I'll put on some uh, YouTube and get lost for a little bit. So as you know, if you've watched YouTube, there will be suggestions. Um, and I had never watched anything related to veganism, so I'm not sure how this wound up in my suggestions, but it did. And there was an Earthling Ed video, or Earthling Ed debating a meat eater on a street corner. And as I said, I was all in my feelings. I was feeling very negative about myself and I was projecting that onto the world. And I wanted to turn this video on to make fun of vegans to make myself feel better. That's, that's how poorly I was feeling about myself that particular day. And I, uh, I saw Earthling Ed in the thumbnail of the video and I completely judged him uh, as I was judging vegans before I hit play and I saw him as pale and frail with long hair and I thought, wow, what a pompous prick. I'm going to turn this on to see what these awful vegans are saying about other people. I, I want to know really how much better are you than me, you know? And that's what, that's what caused me to turn this video on. And I hit play and as I started to watch the video I was identifying with this meat eater. As Earthling Ed, if you know him, if you've watched his stuff, you know that he's the exact opposite of, of how I judged him. Not pompous at all, uh, not arrogant at all, but very down to earth, very calm, collected, using the Socratic method and Socratic reasoning so he wasn't cramming anything down this, this gentleman's throat, just simply asking questions. And each question he asked, this meat eater, uh, the meat eater would soon admit defeat. Um, to each of these points that he made, reasons he would give as to why he wasn't vegan. And quickly, I started to identify with Earthling Ed and not with this meat eater that I had originally identified with when I turned the video on. Halfway through, through the conversation, there was a point at which the meat eater admitted defeat. And he said, you know what? There is no real justification for me to not be vegan, but I like the way they taste. I like the way animals taste. And that's enough for me to not stop. And that's when Ed delivered his very famous line and a line that I'll, I'll use in my outreach uh, any chance I can get. And that is, what do you value higher? The taste pleasure that you get, the 15 minutes of fleeting taste pleasure that you get from eating an animal or the life of that said animal. If we're making that choice that is negatively impacting another mm -hmm. one, we don't have to and we simply buy something else, then we have to reflect and look at that and ask ourselves whether or not it's an ethical decision to do. What, what, what's, what's more important, taste or life? Oof. What kind of life you live in, though? Well, of course, the, life. Their yeah. life, life of an yeah. animal. Life of an animal. What's more important, the taste of the taste enjoyment you get from chicken, or the life of that chicken? If you're talking about like my perspective, from well, you, for you personally, I don't eat chicken, but I would say how that chicken tastes. Okay, so uh, okay, like I don't really care about that chicken. I don't know him. And when he said that, I internalized that question and asked it my to to myself. And the only answer I can come up with is, oh my God, I'm. Can I? Can I? Can I curse? I was going to say, I'm an asshole. You know, uh, um, this is the reason why I've been paying for animals to be commodified, exploited, to have, uh, to be bred into existence, to be separated from their families, to have their throat slit for my pleasure, for my taste pleasure. I mean, that's, that's how a rapist thinks, you know, um, they do, they do things that victimize others because it brings them pleasure. And in this moment, I, I, I thought, my God, what a hypocrite I am. I've got to make a change. And it's possible that because I was in such a low moment, you know, I was a bit harder on myself in the sense of being a hypocrite and being a non-vegan. And I, when he asked that question, which led me to internalize it, I became vegan on the spot and finished that video. 
and I was on fire. Like I was like, oh my gosh, I have to learn more. Here I was, uh, I think that night I stayed up to like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., the next couple nights just researching, finding all these, you know, uh, Paul Bashir and Joey Carbstrong and um, James Aspie, and I'm finding all this, this, there's this whole vegan movement going on for the animals that I never knew existed. And so I wanted to be part of that movement. I wanted to, to try to help fix the mess that I had made, right? <clears throat> So three days later, I got up enough uh, courage to watch my first slaughterhouse footage. And it's, it's, a, it's a short, I think, five-minute video by Paul Bashir, and it's called 1,000 Eyes. If you were to type it into YouTube, you'd have to type, watch 1,000 Eyes. <clears throat> and I said, well, this one's only five minutes. I can handle it, right? So I turned it on, and much like the reaction I'm having right now, just thinking about it, uh, you know, I had a very emotive response, and I, uh, I let some angry and sad tears go. And I uh, almost threw my phone with such frustration. You know, I, this is what I've been paying for? This is the reality of it? And I woke up all at once. This is three days later, and I decided to become an activist. I didn't yet know what that meant, but I decided I'm going to find out, and I'm going to do what that is. So I went outside and my fiance was out there lounging in, in our hammock in our carport and I said, "Hun, I'm about to I'm I'm I'm, be, I'm an activist. I'm going to be an animal rights activist and I'm going to try to uh uh achieve animal liberation, hon." And she's like, "Babe, we just went vegan 3 days 3 days ago." And by this at this point, um sorry for the tangent. She was vegan by default because I went home on my first day and I was like, babe, I'm going to go vegan. She was like, well, you're the cook, so I guess I'm vegan by default. I do all the cooking, so she, was, she had no problem with it. It was great tasting food. She didn't miss a step. So here we are three days later and I, I had to tell her this new revelation that I'm now going to be an activist. And she was like, babe, whoa, slow down. What does this mean? We just went vegan three days ago and now you're an activist? Like, what does that even mean? And I said, well, you watch this video for me. And I uh, hit replay on that, on that same video, 1,000 Eyes, and I said, well, you watch this for me? And I, I left her my phone and went inside to give her privacy. And she came back to me inside the house, and with tears in her eyes, she said, we have to do something about this. So we have been, yeah. Sorry, let me recollect myself. <laughs> God damn. Yeah, all right, so... There you go. You want to tangent with that? Sorry, I didn't mean to get all. What is veganism anyways? Define it. So veganism, if you were to define it by how it was originally defined, I believe, by the vegan society, it's something to the extent of wherever practically possible, practicable or possible, um, avoid harming animals, avoid uh, supporting the exploitation or abuse of animals. What do I believe veganism is? I believe it's the moral imperative. I believe it's the moral baseline to be vegan. It's not only morally virtuous, and I do believe it is, but I believe it's the moral baseline. And, and the reason I say that is because we're not two to three hundred years ago where we were, we were hunter and gatherers and we had to kill animals, possibly, to survive. You know, now we don't have to. We're spoiled. We have a grocery store in every single corner. If you're on food stamps, if you're homeless, there's vegan options for you when you, when, you, know, when you go and purchase um, with, with an EBT card. You can buy vegetables. If you're homeless, you can go to a homeless shelter. There's vegan options there. In America, in 2022, there is absolutely no excuse to pay for the commodification, exploitation of animals for our taste pleasure, or for our nutrition, or for our habits, or for our traditions. Uh, just give me a couple questions. I'm just curious, what, what do people ask you when they find out you're vegan? Yeah, the most common question I get when people ask me why I'm vegan or about veganism in general is typically how I became vegan. So I'll give them, I'll give them my story um, and encourage them as best as I can. What have you noticed different since becoming vegan, physically, mentally, emotionally, anything? Sure, so after going vegan, I actually lost 83 pounds. Um, I was 268 pounds and I started to lose some weight just by way of eating healthier. I was eating mostly raw. I started losing weight and I said, wow, it's really easy to eat healthy on this, this vegan diet. 
and I have so much more energy than I had before. I'm not weighed down, I'm not bogged down, I'm not constipated all the time. And I had this incredible amount of energy, both physically from what I was eating, but also because I was learning more about what I had been responsible for my entire life and I was making a change. Um, so I was, you know, elated and as I said before, you know, a bit on fire, uh, mentally, like spiritually, if you will. And this motivation is what led me down to get back in shape. And so I started run, bike, swim. Every day I would, I would do a little run, bike, swim, one, one or more. I wanted to get down to my like college weight when I was, you know, uh, in the best shape of my life, which was 185. And I did so. And I did that on the vegan diet. And I did it healthily and I did it safely and I never felt better. And then uh, I caught my COVID-30. You know, I think they say, what, college 20 or something? It was the COVID-30 for me after the lockdown and, you know, just kind of hanging out in the house a little bit more. I gained some of that weight back, but it's okay. What are the most important reasons for you to be vegan now as opposed to when you initially went? Well, the most important reasons to be vegan now are the same as as then and that is for the ethical reasons uh, for the animals right fta as you see it we're lucky that you know the environmental the health um you could even say preventative measures for the for the next future pandemic um antibiotic resistance all these things are good reasons to go vegan um, but the number one reason for me, and I feel for others, should be the victim. When people say, how can I go vegan? It's too difficult. What I'll often say back is, it's only difficult to go vegan if you're using, using a selfish mindset. And I, use, and I mean this with all due respect. It's going to be difficult to go vegan if you're using a selfish mindset. If you're thinking only about yourself and how am I going to get, you know, how, what am I going to make tonight? Um, how am I going to get my nutri nutrition? All these unanswered questions about me, me, me. If you think about the victim, use empathy and put yourself in the victim's position, it should be easy every time. So when you see that neatly wrapped package of flesh in the supermarket, you're going to see the victim. And there won't be much choice involved. You're going to be repelled by that because you recognize there's a victim who suffered and died for that piece of flesh to be neatly wrapped and packaged in your grocery store. And then all will follow. You know, you're going to find out what recipes to cook and, and what um, new ingredients to use. All that will come. And why is it important for others to be vegan? Because a lot of times people think to each his own. I hear that a lot as well, to each, to each their own. Um, and, you know, that, that brings me uh, back to like personal choice. And personal choice ceases to be a personal choice once there's a victim involved, right? So that's why I can't say it's my personal choice. Like if, if I was in the courtroom and um, uh, the judge said, why did you do it? You know, why did you kill that man? And I said, well, it was my personal choice, you know, to each his own. He'd say, well, you're going to prison for the rest of your life, right? Because there's a victim involved. It's, I can't say it's my personal choice to kick my dog because there's a victim involved. Um, so, so personal choices can only be personal when they're truly personal, when there's no one else involved and, and no victims at the end of your choices. How do you encourage others to be vegan? I guess it depends on the situation, right? Um, I guess it depends on the context. I'll remind myself that I wasn't born vegan and I wasn't, um, you know, I'm not some virtuous person who figured out how to be kind and compassionate and you can't do it yourself. Just like I said, put yourself in the victim's position, use their perspective. When you're talking to the pre-vegan, uh, you know, remember to put yourself in their position as well and look at the conversation from their perspective, which was once your perspective as a pre-vegan. And share your personal story, uh, share your personal anecdotes, whatever they may be, and always bring it back to the victim. Always try to get people to see these animals as victims, because that's what they are. But we've become so disconnected from the food that is on our plate um, that we honestly 
you know, when I used to eat animals, I would, I would see a chicken breast or, um, you know, cow flesh on my plate, and I would honestly just see those items as products. I, I really would. I would, I would, you know, I would block it out, I'm sure, subconsciously, unconsciously, but I would just see these items as products. So, so I always try to frame the conversation with the victim's perspective in mind. What kind of challenges have you had since becoming vegan and how did you overcome this? You know, when I think about the challenges that I've had since going vegan, um, the challenges are so overcasted by all of the great things that have happened in my life since then that I, I maybe just don't pay much attention to them. I don't store that information up in my brain. There's no room for it. How has being vegan affected your relationships? So I am very lucky. The day after I went vegan, my, my dad came into the shop that I had. I was working the next day and he would always come in and stop in a few times a week to say hi to me. He walks in, um, born in 1949 in Jersey from poverty, uh, grew up as like a, you know, a biker dude, still in his 70s, has his long hair, trying to keep it going and got the long beard. A stoic male figure is how I'd refer to my dad, you know? I thought the last person that would ever well, I knew he would understand me, but I thought maybe the last person that would ever actually embrace the lifestyle that I chose. He walks in and I'm like, yo, Pops, I got to tell you something. I went vegan. And he's like, oh, I've heard of that before. It's like vegetarian. And I was like, kind of. Let me explain. So I explained it to him and I told him about some of the standard legal practices, trying to prep him to show him uh, a video of some sort. I didn't have to show him the video. He stopped me mid-sentence and he said, I'm with you, son. I'll do it with you. And, and I was like, really? Is, is that easy? And, and he's like, well, you know, I've, I've, uh, I'd like to create more positive in my life. You know, I'm getting older and this is a good way to do that. And I'm like, wow, it's, it's, it's this easy to turn people vegan. I mean, let's keep going with this. You know, later found out it's not always that easy. My mom, I, I called her the same day that my fiance watched 1000 Eyes and asked her if I could send that video over to her. Uh, she was a little bit worried as the, the, the main cook in the house that, oh, dad's now vegan? So you mean I have to cook two different meals every night? Because she wasn't readily embracing the idea of going vegan initially. And I called her on that third day and asked her to watch that same video that had such a profound effect on Stephanie and, and on myself. And she called me back almost immediately, immediately with audible tears in her eyes and said, I'm with you, son. And my nephew, who was living with my parents at the time, he took about a month, but he was like in it uh, mentally, but he took about a month because of pizza. So his friends would order pizza and he, he would pick off the flesh but he would still eat the cheese pizza, not really understanding, you know, where dairy comes from and, and anything about the dairy industry. He hadn't done any research. As soon as he did his own research, he said, forget about that. I'm, I'm done with that as well. So, you know, my, my immediate family, they all went vegan. So I had no worries with my relationships there. I did lose at least one of my really close friends and have have kind of uh, the relationship with one of my other really close friends from high school has been a little rocky since um, you know they don't quite understand it and they respond at once with with uh, dressing up he dressed up like a farmer his wife who was pregnant at the time dressed up like a, a pregnant dairy cow and they dressed their little girl up as a uh, pig and a, and a you know like a pig costume and we're very close when I mean, we talk, we did talk more frequently then. There's no way that he didn't realize or, or have me in mind when making these choices to dress up like that for Halloween, you know, unless he's just completely mindless and I don't believe him to be, he's a, he's a pretty intelligent guy. That relationship, still love him. We still talk to each other. That relationship has been a bit strained and my other friendship, we don't, we don't talk at all. So I lost, you know, one friend uh, from all this. And I gained hundreds, hundreds of friends, yeah. Could you be with someone who isn't vegan? I could not. I want to say I could not be with somebody who's not vegan right off the cusp. 
but I might use that as an opportunity for outreach. I might just, knowing that they're not vegan, yeah, let's, let's go. I'm going to turn you vegan. Kind of like know? a vegan pimp. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Maybe, yeah. that, maybe that's not yeah. a good time. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, exclusive, exclusive relationship, you know. Um, yeah. Sorry, I don't know where you're fine. from. <laughs> How might your life been different if you were raised vegan? How might my life be different if I had been raised vegan? Wow. How might the world been, be different if the world was raised vegan? I think if I was raised vegan, if I was raised to respect other species down to the smallest of insects, how minuscule would my differences with others, with other human beings as I grew up seem, right? If I learned to respect others for their differences outside of our species, um, imagine how my outlook would have been on the world. I have to imagine that I would have been kinder um, to myself and others. Do you have any regrets? Well, obviously, most of us would say that we all regret not going vegan sooner. I have a regret each time, each time I'm out in public and I could have created the opportunity to do some outreach and I don't because maybe um, it's the weekend, I slept in late, maybe I went out in my jogging pants and I, you know, wasn't, I didn't look nice um, and was maybe afraid how someone might judge me based upon my looks and so I didn't say anything or, you know, maybe we're in a public setting where it's not fitting for me to open my mouth. Every time I do that, I regret it. So I try not to do that. I try to always open my mouth and always advocate for the animals because I don't want to have those regrets because those hurt, those regrets hurt. Because that's an opportunity where I could have spoken up for them and I could have possibly changed uh, the future for at least one animal if, and, and for that person, right? What kind of mistakes have you had since going vegan? What kind of mistakes I've had since going vegan, I would say, and it's often referred to as like vistopia. It's kind of like, um, uh, how would you say, like an existential crisis. My mistake there is after going vegan and becoming active right away, because the reason I became active right away was sort of fueled by my guilt in the beginning, and now it's not as much, but it was sort of fueled by my guilt. And I didn't think that I would ever reach a point where I would have that existential crisis and look at the world like, how can you not wake up and see what I see? How are you not seeing it, right? But, but after so many attempts, maybe after like the, the first year and a half of me being active and realizing that, wow, there's a lot more work to be done. I thought this was gonna be a lot easier. And I, I did have a little bit of that, that vistopia going on, that existential crisis. So I guess maybe the mistake is just, just lying to myself and not being as much of a realist as I could have been. So when you said activist too soon, it sounded like you said maybe, maybe because you had too much fire and, and it was coming across wrong. Is that right, maybe? So what I meant was after going vegan, I was elated and, and high on the fact that I was making a change in the world and making a change, making sort of reparation for the mistakes that I have made in, in paying for something that I'm so against, right? So I was just, I, I, I saw only uh, positive. My mistake was lack of uh, self-reflection. I was so high on the fact that I was making a change, I really thought I would, you know, achieve animal liberation within a year. You know, maybe I didn't put it like that in my, my mind, but I, I, I had that like inner feeling. And so I failed to realize how much work was really involved um, to actually achieve animal liberation. I, I failed to look at the bigger picture, maybe. And that's what created that. Dystopia. And that's what created that sort of dystopia, that sort of um, existential crisis later on, once I realized that I was being too optimistic. And it's good, it's good to be optimistic, and I still am, but it's, it's good to be uh, realistic as well, right? I think dystopia is inevitable. I think it is, too. And uh, I lied to myself and told me it'll never happen to me. Why didn't you go vegan sooner? Why didn't I go vegan sooner? Obviously, it has to start with the indoctrination of our youth and, you know, my parents weren't vegan and we ate mostly Italian food and, uh, you know, New Jersey cuisine uh, is, 
is mostly based around the Italian culture. So everything's, you know, cheese and uh, chicken and cow flesh and pig flesh. I don't think there's like really one vegan dish, maybe egg, no, not even eggplant parmesan. That's got um, coagulated baby cow's milk in it. That's why, I mean, because yeah. uh, your culture, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prior to going vegan, did you ever think there was no way you could do it? Prior to going vegan, I don't know that I ever really entertained the fact that I had the potential to go vegan. I lied to myself and, and told myself that I had to eat animals and animal products for my health, for my nutrition. Um, so I don't know if I ever really entertained it. You could talk about my point system in going vegan. So a lot of activists, we will talk about uh, the point system. So like maybe on a scale of zero to 100, it's the tipping point, kind of like critical mass when we're talking about the population and, and changing how, the, how society views things. On an individual level, you might have, like say for instance, with my dad, right? He went vegan on the spot as soon as I informed him and educated him on standard legal practices. And he later shared with me a story where he was working late one night and there was a gentleman that was working for him and had a secondary job, a, a night shift job. After construction, iron work, he would go and drive trucks. And he had clocked out of, of his job with my dad as the foreman and came back a, a few hours later and he was inebriated, intoxicated, had been drinking. And he came to my dad and he said, I, I uh, forgot I have a, a shift with my second job tonight and I went out and, and drank a bunch, not realizing. Can you do me a favor and will you drive this truck for me tonight? And my dad, uh, you know, being the people pleaser he is and the helpful person, kind person he is, he said, yep, after the shift, I'll help you out. Just hang out and wait. Didn't realize, but when he got there, the truck had live animals in the back. And he, he said, oh, you know, to himself, he said, oh my, this is not what I signed up for. I didn't realize, but I already promised the guy. So I'm going to follow through with it. And so he drove the truck. And when he got there to whatever facility it was, there, it was cows on the, on the back. That, that's who was on the back of this truck. And when he got there, he said a uh, slaughterhouse worker came out and walked under the truck with his bolt gun. And he was bolt gunning the cows on the truck and smiling and laughing at my dad like, <laughs> yeah, look, look. And he was purposely missing and, you know, causing them pain as it was some sort of joke and, and the guy was getting enjoyment out of it. And my dad freaked out and yelled and, and chased the guy down, trying to chase him down to get the bolt gun away from him. And he said he had a real, like, for the next couple weeks, if not months uh, or more, he, he, you know, refrained from maybe eating so many cows. And he, I don't even know if he knew what the term vegan was, but, you know, in his mind, he was figuring out, like, I'm a moral hypocrite here. I, I need to live more in alignment with my actions, uh, you know, I mean, with my beliefs here. And uh, that was on the, the point system of zero to 100. That's a pretty big deal going through all that. That may have, you know, put him at 75 points right there. And then when I talked to him later on, that might have been the 25 that put him over. If he had not had that previous experience, maybe he wouldn't have been so affected by his son going vegan. And myself, I, I had that as well. Like, uh, my fiance had reminded me, I had never talked about going vegan in the past, but I ate cows, chickens, pigs, and fish, uh, or another sea life. And when presented with the opportunity to eat another animal at a, at a different restaurant that might have sheep or whatever other animal I hadn't already been eating, I didn't want to add to the amount of animals that I was responsible for um, their suffering, right? So I did know somewhere that I was the cause of this because I didn't want to broaden my horizons on my, my abuse, right? And another thing, before I opened up my retail shop, I had uh, entertained the possibility of opening up a small restaurant instead of a retail shop. But because I wanted to open up like a burger shop or something like this, like, you know, a uh, greasy fast food type thing, I realized that, wait a second, so now I would have to be buying en masse animal, animal parts, right? Animal body parts. 
So not am I only now responsible for the animals that I'm consuming, but I would also be responsible for all the animals that my patrons consumed, and I'd be profiting off of their misery. I went through all this in my head without ever entertaining the philosophy of veganism. This was part of my point system, you know? After I realized I don't want to profit off of their death, maybe I got 20 points out of that. And it pushed me a little bit closer so that when I saw this Earthling Ed video, my guard was a bit lowered and it was easier for me to go vegan. And that's why a lot of times when you're outreaching to somebody, um, it, it's good to not get discouraged if you didn't turn them vegan on the spot because you worked on their point system. That's why you hear planting seeds. Planting seeds is, is another word for uh, the, you know, increasing their points on their point system. You plant those seeds and hopefully they grow and then the next person comes along or maybe they even see a billboard and that's what pushes them over the edge. They, they leave the conversation that you had, they see a billboard and they're like, there's my sign, I'm going vegan. Do you take supplements? So the only supplement that I take is the same supplement that I took before going vegan. I've just found a vegan product and that is a multivitamin. So um, it's got your B12 in it. I take a multivitamin I've always have my entire life and now I take a multivitamin. That's all that's changed. How do you suggest others get started? I would suggest they adopt the victim's perspective, obviously, and put themselves in the victim's shoes or hooves. Um, use empathy. Like when I first went vegan, I didn't know about Challenge 22. I didn't know about all these resources that were out there. Um, there are tons of resources out there for you. I, I mean, how to get started? Google it. Google veganism. How to get started on making a vegan pizza? Google vegan pizza. You'll get a thousand recipes in return. So there are programs like Challenge 22, which is all interfaced through Facebook. So it's super accessible and easy to follow. And you get a team of mentors and a nutritionist, if need be, if you have any sort of ailments or health concerns. And each day they'll give you a new challenge to complete with others. So you have community, you have camaraderie, you have other people to rely on and ask questions. And each day you'll have a new challenge, like today's vegan pizza day, tomorrow's, you know, so on, yada, yada. And then at those, the end of those 22 days, um, you've likely created a new habit because it's, it's often said that it takes 21 days to create a new habit. So t challenge 22 gives you one day extra. It's entirely free. They never ask for a credit card. They never ask for any money. Uh, it's literally just run by a bunch of volunteers who care about animals and want you to care about animals as well. You have a favorite quote? Yeah, I've got a few favorite quotes, but in terms of veganism, Pythagoras, the Italian philosopher, I'll just sort of um, paraphrase what he said, but he, he was a vegan in his time, and he said that as long as humans are murdering animals, they will continue to murder each other. I like him much more for that quote than his theorem because, you know, who needs math? And you said he was a vegan? Was he really a vegan? In his time. I mean, okay. he, he was probably a vegetarian and probably an opportunist because, you know what <laughs> yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, as much as da Vinci was a vegan, you know? <laughs> uh, anything about vegans you want to see changed? Anything about vegans? Yeah. If I could change anything about vegans, if I had a magic wand, I would make all vegans become animal rights activists, right? Because there's, there's so few of us, we're like one to 3% of the population. Most vegans want to see a vegan world, meaning most vegans want to see less animal suffering. And the quickest way to get to a vegan world, to animal liberation, is to become active. This is a good segue into- AAM. AAM, AAM yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about that real quick. Okay, so AAM is an acronym for Animal Activism Mentorship. Uh, their website is theanimalsneedyou.com. It was started by some very close friends and mentors of mine at the beginning of the pandemic. And it's very similar to the structure of a Challenge 22 or Veganuary. Th those are programs to help people become vegan through mentorship. Well, AAM or Animal Activism Mentorship is a program to help people become active. So. If you had never been active before, don't know what animal rights are or what actions you can take, like, like myself, when I decided to become an activist, well, there are resources like AAM out there and you can be paired up with a mentor. And I believe it's 90 days after 
um, being with your mentor for 90 days, you have the chance to be a mentor yourself and continue helping others. What kind of foods do you like to eat? Favorite food is pizza, always has been, uh, always will be. The vegan cheese is on its way up. It's really, it hasn't matched regular um, pus, blood, and feces filled dairy mozzarella, but nothing tastes as good as compassionate feels, right? And vegan pizza is just fine with me. So my, my favorite uh, vegetable would be kale. I eat it almost every single day. I wasn't a big fan of kale before going vegan. It's now a staple, like oddly a staple in my diet because I had tried it at more vegan restaurants and I never knew that you were supposed to massage the kale. You gotta massage the kale. You know, it's, it's such a, a thick uh, leaf that it doesn't break down like romaine lettuce or iceberg lettuce or spinach. Um, so you literally pour your dressing on and you massage the, the, the liquid and all the seasoning and the flavor into the kale and it breaks it down, makes it more palatable and soft. Love kale. And then like a typical breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Typical breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't normally eat breakfast. I'll usually like intermittent fast until the afternoon. But if I was, uh, I would probably go with like a, a nice tofu scramble where you take one pound of extra firm tofu one pound of silken tofu, you chunk up the firm, and then you just kind of squeeze the silken, and it makes it you know, seem like what you're more used to, and add a little bit of just egg if need be, and a pre-vegan would never know the difference. Lunch, you, you want something that's easy and quick, so I would probably do like a Buddha bowl or a power bowl or something, and that's just, I would generally take like uh, leftovers maybe from the night before if I had brown rice or quinoa or whatever starch I had left over from the night before. You put that in a bowl, then you take some kale and you put that next to the quinoa. Whatever other veggies you have, you kind of just stack them around the bowl and pour dressing on them. You get all your nutrients and it's quick and easy. Uh, for dinner, okay, typical dinner, uh, um, at least once a week we eat Honduran enchiladas in this house. And I know Stephanie explained that earlier, but the way I see it is like an open face sandwich, right? And traditional Mexican enchiladas are wrapped up with soft corn tortillas, and then you add the red enchilada sauce and bake it. Honduran enchiladas, you use the, um, the flat, already toasted tortilla, and then you would, you would build it. So you'd put your, your black beans and your chismol, which is like pico de gallo, and your coleslaw and everything on top, your uh, sour cream. It's a really messy food. You have to pick it up like this and you bite it and the shell cracks and everything falls off and it's great, you pick it up with your hands and you eat it. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of our go-tos. That's one of our weeklies. Is it expensive to eat vegan? So it's a common misconception that to eat vegan foods is more expensive. It's very much the epitome of the opposite. So all the cheapest foods in the supermarket are going to be vegan by default, right? Rice, lentils, beans, legumes, seasonal fruits and seasonal vegetables. These are all the cheapest foods in the market. Now, if you're going to do the, the, the impossible meat, the beyond meat, the vegan cheeses, all this kind of stuff, you don't have to. But yes, they're due to supply and demand, and there being less of us that are interested in these compassionate products, you do have to pay a little bit more. But what are we talking, a few, like 10%, 20% more? I'd gladly pay 50% more to choose compassion, right? So it's, it's minuscule. What do you think about people going on these meat-based diets like paleo, Atkins, carnivore, keto? I would say it's ill-informed and the science is out there. There's plenty of scientific evidence to suggest that the leading cause of death in America, which is heart disease, is caused by eating animal products. That's, that's one of the main reasons, right? Cancers, osteoporosis. I don't know, maybe it's a macho thing. You know, I got to eat my meat. But there's nothing macho, there's nothing manly, right, about uh, paying for innocent animals to be abused and exploited on your behalf, right? Uh, a man, in, in my eyes, is an anti-bully, right? A man is someone who stick, sticks up for the innocent, the vulnerable, the easily taken advantage of. That's what a man does, you know, and I, I, I use this a lot when describing, like, why am I bothered by hunting, right? That's done as a very uh, manly pastime, right? But there's nothing manly about going out to the woods with a rifle and shooting an animal that's as 
as vulnerable as a child. I mean, that's the equivalence here of hunting an, a deer in the woods is as easy as hunting a child in the woods. Um, so yeah, a, a real man is someone who sticks up for the innocent, no matter what. You guys got dogs, right? Uh, we have one dog. She's vegan, yep, yep. Our dog eats V-Dog. That's been her favorite. We've tried a few others, and that's been her favorite so far. And it's, it's affordable. And people, they often will ask like, oh, isn't that animal abuse? You know, someone who's trying to make a hypocrite out of me if I'm doing outreach. Isn't that animal abuse to force your dog to be vegan? Well, you're kind of forcing your dog to eat eyelids and toes and ears, right? So you, you have to provide your dog with food. So if you're going to choose one, why not choose the compassionate one and the one that's more healthy, right? Because that's, what, that's what's in your typical dog food. It's all of the, the trimmings, the stuff that we would turn our nose up at. Um, that's what we give to our dogs. Do you ever give your dogs any human food like that you would normally, that you would eat any of your food? Lentils, rice? Oh, uh, we do. So especially if we're eating something healthy that night, I'm never going to give her something deep fried or processed. If we're eating healthy that night, yeah, I'll take a, a scoop of whatever it may be and I'll put it on top of her food for sure. Is your dog a rescue dog? She is, yeah. So Stephanie actually rescued Attila and she was found in Macon, Georgia, and she had probably 60 ticks all over her and in every orifice and on her genitals. And, and at this shelter, they told her that, don't worry, those, those are just skin tags. They'll fall off on their own. And she's like, skin tags don't fall off on their own. These look like ticks, but these are the professionals. I'm pretty sure they're wrong. And when, when she brought her home, you know, we sat there with tweezers having to pick all these ticks off of her body. Has there been other dogs you've rescued? Yeah, we've rescued um, many animals since going vegan. It kind of seems as though uh, those opportunities just present themselves to us. We've rescued a, a deer who was hit, hit by a car and left for dead in the middle of the road. Um, we just recently rescued a uh, dog. We were coming home, it was like 9.30 at night a few weeks ago, and we saw her eyes in the opposite lane of the highway. So we did a U-turn to make sure she was okay, and she wasn't. She needed help. I could fit my hand around her waist. She was emaciated and nearly dead. It didn't take much to convince her to get in the vehicle with us, and we brought her home, and she has since found an amazing, loving home. And uh, we're actually gonna see her tomorrow. Do you think we'll ever see a vegan world, and how can we get there? Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on how we define vegan world, right? When I hear that question, I usually think like a vegan world, a, a place in, in which we really respect animals, right? The vast majority of us, if not all of us. That's what kind of a vegan world means to me. I don't know that we'll ever achieve that, but critical mass. We don't need to necessarily change everyone's mind in order to create a vegan world, right? So critical mass is like 10% to 25% of the population, depending on whatever data you're using um, or whatever context. Um, but, but other forms of social injustice in the past all rested upon a point of critical mass, right? A tipping point. And you don't need to change everyone's mind to create a vegan world. Just that, that 10 to 25%. And if we can do that, we will essentially have a vegan world where we can protect animals the way that we want to and essentially normalize veganism. So this is uh, Lionel and Amos hey, trying, their, eat vegan pizza before? trying their first pizza today. Hey, Lionel. Oh, I took the whole thing. <laughs> okay. He was supposed to share, so with Amos. share with Amos. There he is. I'm glad you like it. And drop. There you go, Amos. And here comes Amos nonchalantly, like I don't notice it. Mine. Oh, he took the rest. That was good, huh? Yeah. Oh, you got pizza breath. Was there any other ones you wanted to do? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, my whole phone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, then we went to Marley. How about a 
and here, Marley. To see if she would like vegan pizza. Want pizza? She definitely did. Okay, and then there was Albert. This is all from this morning. Albert, eat a piece of pizza. Here, Albert. Oh. Now, Albert, course, Albert. Albert is um, oh, rescued from goodness. Smithfield Slaughterhouse in Tar, Tar Heel, North Carolina. And is that, is that so good, buddy? Okay, uh, you left your crust. Left the crust. One of those people, huh? What a waste. Albert is an amazing guy and uh, he was rescued as just a piglet. He was to be cold because he wasn't deemed fit enough to survive the hell that is animal agriculture. And now he's here and he's eating vegan pizza and he's one of my closest friends and I love him.